Uh, essentially, what we'll be going over, we'll be talking about the various reforms and innovations going on in the Army of the 1880, uh, specifically in regards to some of the problems they're having. So to begin, uh, we should get sort of oriented and figure out what are these problems. Well, number one, after the Civil War, the Army is downsized from a million man force to just 25,000 men. Most of those, uh, around 21,000 of them, are located west of the Mississippi. Uh, and by the 1880s, there are some problems starting to appear with this whole system. Uh, number one, the Army is rather unpopular. Uh, that's mostly due to the fact that it's a peacetime army. The only major conflicts going on in the United States are domestic conflicts, uh, so uh, Native American uprisings, as well as what is the other big thing the Army's being used for, especially by the 1880s since the Plains Wars are dying out. Well, they're being used to break strikes and suppress workers. Workers' strikes, workers' rebellions, those are a big problem in the 1880s, and whenever that happens, who do you send in to solve that problem? Well, first line of defense is usually some private uh, agency like the Pinkertons, uh, but if they can't even get a control on things, then they'll send in the army. Uh, and that doesn't really help the army with their public image too much, if at all. So, uh, you have this public image issue. A lot of people don't like the army. They think it's a waste of money. Uh, another big aspect is the army is mostly immigrants, about 40 to 50% immigrants coming mostly from Ireland and Germany. And it's 1800s America, so they're kind of wary of these new immigrants. They're of different cultures, different religions, and different backgrounds that the American population just isn't too uh, familiar with leading to a lot of sort of bad press for the army in regards to that. So the army has these morale pro uh, public image issue. They also have a morale problem uh, within the army. The army is basically when not being used to suppress Native Americans or workers rebellions, they're being used as a manual labor force. Uh, an armed one at that, but still most of the army's everyday duties aren't running around actually fighting, they're building roads, maintaining forts, just building infrastructure for the United States Army. So that means the men aren't too happy and the public doesn't like the Army. So the public not liking the Army creates a budgetary issue. Public doesn't like the Army, that means Congress is not gonna allocate a lot of money to the Army, unlike today. Uh, they just really don't want to spend that kind of cash. So what it creates is this problem of the armies trying to raise the men's morale, raise their public image, all on a limited budget. So how are they going to do these things? Well, number one, uh, as the old adage goes, the best way to improve the men's morale is to improve what they're eating. An army marches on its stomach, and that's just as true in peacetime as it is in wartime. So what's a good way of essentially improving the food of the men on the cheap? Making them grow it themselves. That way you don't have to pay for all the expenses of logistical needs. Uh, here at Fort Mackinac, that all would be signified by the commissary building put in in 1878. That would act as a dry goods storehouse uh, holding a variety of foodstuffs that they would mostly produce here at the fort. Down in Marquette Park, they would have a small soldier's garden, essentially a small farm, growing a variety of fruits and vegetables. Uh, so green beans, potatoes, things like that, just uh, allowing the men to have a bit better diets in that way. As well as that, they would also have the soldier's pasture located down by the Waukesha uh, Grands Golf Course, not the Waukesha Mo Golf Course, the Grand Golf Course right down along the top. Fort Hill, uh, not Fort Hill, uh, Grand Hill down on the west side of the island. I forgot where it was. <laughs> but nonetheless, that would have a herd of beef cattle as well as dairy cattle and a herd of pigs. And this would provide the garrison here fresh pork, fresh dairy, all stored in a rather large ice house 
uh, located outside of the port. There they would cut blocks of ice out of the river or uh, the lake here and bring them up here and that would give you, at least in theory, refrigeration all year round. Uh, of course, by the end of the year, you're hoping that ice doesn't get too low. So, you have better ingredients. Now you need to cook those ingredients. Uh, the army at this time period uh, doesn't really have any dedicated mess specialists or cooks, if you folks will follow me down here. Uh, instead, it is entirely up to uh, the officers to decide who's cooking when, and that's going to be a rotating duty. Uh, so that leads to a bit of a problem as one day, let's say O'Leary's cooking, the next day Hans is cooking. And O'Leary could be a better chef than Hans or vice versa. Uh, so it leads to inconsistency and in least quality of cooking. And the officers know this, so they'll try to fudge the numbers and at least try to get one man on cooking duty who actually knows what he's doing at least every day. So uh, the mess halls would be located right out back behind the soldiers barracks here, that L-shaped sort of stick out. Those would be the two mess halls and kitchens, uh, one for each company. Now at the same time during the 1880s, there's also a major hygiene craze going on within the army. Uh, and that's signified mostly by our post bathhouse put in in 1885. Uh, in this period, there's still some combat over germ theory versus miasma theory. Germ theory, of course, being what we all know and love today. Uh, whereas miasma theory is a much older belief in the fact that uh, bad smells and bad air causes disease instead of little microbes. So uh, it leads to essentially right answer, wrong uh, solution, wrong way to get there. So the, in 1885, amid this big hygiene craze, the army is going to put in the post bathhouse. This would prove a great boon to the men going from bathing maybe once or twice a month, typically down in the lake uh, when it is not frozen over, or if it is frozen over, up here, in the squad rooms uh, those would be rather uh, not very clean situations mostly because well if you're the last guy in your squad to get in the bath they're not taking the time to change out the water heat up new water etc so if you're the last guy in line not only are you taking a dirty bath you're taking probably a pretty cold one anyway so the post bathhouse here would be one of the first places on the island actually to have hot and cold running water. They would have a little steam boiler as well as an attendant to heat that water. Uh, so very good increase for the men's hygiene. They'd go again from bathing once or twice a month to now upwards of two times a week. At the same time, the army is also improving the men's sleep. Uh, as you may know, prior to this period, such as in the Civil War, the main sort of sleeping setup, especially in garrison, is a wood slat bed and a hay mattress. That's literally a big cotton sack full of hay. Uh, and that doesn't really lead to very comfortable sleeping, nor is it very hygienic, as lice, bed bugs can easily burrow their way into those hay bags. So, uh, beginning in the 1880s, they would start issuing out proper iron frame beds with proper cotton mattresses, so the men are getting at least a little bit better sleep. Uh, if you'll follow me down here. Another big element that the army is concerned about is education. Uh, again, as I said, about 40 to 50 percent of the army is immigrants at that time, as well as that. The Army kind of has a literacy issue. Uh, here at Fort Mackinac, we had a 60% literacy during the 1870s, meaning 40% of the garrison thereabout couldn't read or write English. And that's a major problem, especially in the peacetime Army. And the peacetime armies love bureaucratic red tape, they love paperwork, and you need your men to be able to fill out and do all that paperwork. But if they can't read or write English, so much for that. 
So in 1879, as part of an army-wide program, they'll put in the reading room. This will act as a 600-volume library for the men, as well as acting as a schoolhouse, teaching them a variety of skills, uh, mostly in regards to reading, writing, arithmetic, basic U.S. history and geography, uh, but nonetheless a great boon to the men, giving them an education they never would have had otherwise. Um, it's actually very important in this period. Public education really wasn't a thing when these men were children. And now that it is a thing, they can still get access to it via programs such as the reading room. Now, uh, the morale issue is still around though. And in 1889, they'll come up with a new way of solving it. Uh, in the 1880s though, uh, we have to sort of preface this conversation with understanding how bad alcoholism was in the 1880s. During this time period, Americans are on average drinking five to eight gallons of hard liquor every year per person. So there is a massive alcohol consumption and that leads to some problems, mostly endemic alcoholism across the United States, especially in the army. Uh, so what would the soldiers do? You can't stop them from drinking. Prohibition is in its infancy. It is starting around this time period, mostly due to the horrors of just how widespread alcoholism is. Uh, but uh, the men would typically try to get leave passes and go downtown to the various bars and hotels, drink there. Uh, but you might know a little problem as if any of you walked up that hill, pretty hard to walk up sober. I can't imagine doing it drunk. Uh, and that would lead to soldiers not doing it. They would fall asleep on people's porches, underneath their porches, in their gardens, all across the place forcing the fort here to send out garrisons of guards every day to go collect all the AWOL soldiers. So in 1889, they solved this problem by putting in the post canteen right here into the wood quarters. This would be a means by which uh, if you can't stop the men from drinking, you can bring the drink to the men and kind of control it. Downtown bartenders would be working off of commission, so they'd make their money based on how much alcohol they sold, uh, and that would lead to severe over-serving. Meanwhile, here at the post canteen, the bartender here is a regular soldier, probably an entrusted NCO, like a corporal or a sergeant, and he's not gonna wanna mess up, so that cuts back on the over-serving problem. Also, it acts as a morale booster. Uh, it's a place for the men to gather, sort of relax, free from the hardships of army life. Not only would they serve alcohol, uh, but also food, light fares, snacks, sandwiches, just little morale boosters to help the men sort of adjust to army life. Also, they would have the post canteen, uh, post exchange put into the wood quarters. This would act as a small convenience store uh, essentially selling basic items that the army didn't issue you. Things like tobacco, soap, tooth powder, toothpaste, toothbrushes, things like that. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of these sort of innovations go on well into today. Uh, programs such as the Reading Room are the beginning of army educational programs such as the GI Bill which many people use today to, pay to get a college education for free. Uh, as well as that, every post nowadays still has a post canteen, still has a post exchange, albeit the post exchange is more like a weird convenience store nowadays than anything. Uh, but all of these sort of innovations and reforms that we associate with everyday military life nowadays all begin really right here in the 1880s when the army is moving from a more old army frontier style militia force of the Civil War, going into what we know as the new army, uh, going into World War I, World War II, and of course, all the way up into today. So if you folks have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, other than that, coming up at one o'clock, we will be having a cannon firing demonstration. 
That'll be up those black steps down in the southeastern corner of the fort. Either way you go, uh, thank you folks for joining me out here, and I hope you have a wonderful day here at Fort Mackinac. Thank you. Thank you.